talking about uh, the unwell child. So there'll be about an hour each with lots of um, uh, lots of time to ask questions. So over to you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Maika, and um, Frances will be introducing herself in a moment. Uh, I'd like to say that we we are absolutely thrilled and delighted to uh, be with you today. Um, we know it's very difficult, uh, and uh, we we have a real love for Myanmar and for Myanmar people, women and their babies, and um, we're, we were delighted when Marcus asked us uh, to uh, do, some, uh, do some teaching with you. Um, I've got a little uh, PowerPoint that I'm going to show. Um, uh, sorry, hang on. If I can find it. There we go. Uh, hopefully, it will come up. Wait, I'll do it one more time. I do apologise. There we go. So, um, Hopefully you can see that. Uh, yeah, that's coming. That's beautiful. Great. Okay. Uh, so um, I'm Mica, and uh, we. Some of the pictures haven't come up, unfortunately, but um, we have been working in Mongolia since 2007, and uh, also in Chin State uh, and in the Delta since uh, 2013. We um, work by, um, we do lots of interactive work. Normally, if we were with you, we would be introducing ourselves, we'd be talking, we'd be sharing, and uh, we'd be doing lots of hands-on, um, sort of playing with a doll and a pelvis and using lots of materials. So we're not able to do that in quite the same way, but we still want you to join in as much as possible. And we'll be using the chat function uh, for questions and for um, live discussion as much as we can. Um, uh, we've been running TBA programs, traditional birth attendant programs. Uh, we've run a train the trainer session so in my, hopefully you can see my cursor this is training the trainer and these are nurses uh who are in chin um and a group of midwives as well uh we've run tba program we've made lots of friends and we've also worked with uh, government midwives um, uh, we, we have a lot of fun while well, we did and we do a lot of uh, sort of practicing. One of the things that we'd encourage you to do is uh, to practice things with your hands. Uh, if you can get a, a doll or even just wrap up, uh, make a doll with um, material so that you can practice how the baby is delivered, practice uh, cutting the cord and things like that, it really helps put it in your mind. Um, and we want to know from you, uh, I'm going to hand over to Francis, but we want to know from you uh, what you most want to know. We will be um, sending videos week by week and then having live lessons and we want to hear from you who most <coughs> need from us. But Francis, I'm going to hand over to you. Will you put your camera on, Francis? On? Start video. No. Can't find it. Uh, it? Oh, Marcus, can you help? Where would you find the? 
Yeah, yeah. Oh. bottom bottom left hand corner, Francis, where there's a there's a there you go, you're on. Hello everybody. Um, I'm Francis. I've been a midwife for uh, over 45 years. Um, yes, I've traveled with Micah for um, lots of wonderful trips to Mongolia and Myanmar. Um, we've also been down to the Irrawaddy Delta um, with another charity. So we have lots of experience of difficult journeys in Myanmar. We know what it's like to sit on a back of a motorbike for nine hours. Um, and we know how difficult life is for you all. Um, so we're very excited to start this programme because um, we missed coming and um, we hope that you'll benefit from it. And um, please, as Micah says, um, tell us anything you need um, that you would like us to, to bring to, to, to um, let you know how, how and, and you let us know how things are in Myanmar and what we need to help you with. And also, we'd also love to know and what sort of equipment you have um, and how you get this equipment. Um, so, um, yes, should we start now, Micah? And, um... Yes. So, um, uh, yes, so just to add to Francis, to finish, we, we, we really, we are, um, you know, delighted to be with you. We, uh, because of all our trips to Myanmar, we've been in the countryside, we've been in very remote parts, and we do know how difficult the situation is uh, in the most rural parts if you don't have equipment. But one of the things we wanted to say to you was um, that, um, you know, when the midwives leave Yangon, many of them go to very remote parts and they go, uh, you know, they might be on their own, uh, and they will have delivered maybe five babies. They will have had the training, of course, but they also feel uh, nervous when those babies first start coming. But the thing to be most reassured about is the time. Babies, uh, you know, babies deliver well. They need a little bit of help. They need a little bit of um, support and the mothers need support. And most of the time it goes really well. So it's really important to uh, you know to trust the process uh, and to just make sure that you're there uh, to help for the few times when it doesn't go so well. Um, so the first thing we wanted to ask you in the chat box if you can um, what what is your experience right now? So are you have you delivered babies? Um, do you uh, have you had positive experiences? Have you had worries? Uh, what have you so far since you've been uh, nurses or in your nurse training? Uh, what's your experience of midwifery care? If you are able to use the chat box, that would be great. Or Sister Momo, if you know a little bit, maybe you can tell us uh, where these uh, amazing nurses are in terms of experience. Yeah, sure. Morning, I'm Momo. Um, the, the thing is, here we have different levels of nursing, nursing students and already in clinical nurse. So there might be, they might have a different experience from my point of view. One of my one of my students called me the other day. He will, he is in Chin State right now, in a small village. His stepmom got a baby delivered on the day he he was with them in the middle of the night, but they did not have the facility at all. So they delivered at home with what he had. And can, for instance, the rat to cut the umbilical cord, and even they use bamboo strip to cut the cord. Yeah. That is one of my experts. I, the funny thing is, I've never been in the position of delivering a baby until now. It's funny. Yeah. Yes. We have so, seen that ourselves. Yeah. 
I wrote a little better. Oh, can I ask it, some explanation to my students and organizers in Bernie? Yeah. Okay, so um, we, uh, we know how difficult it is and we know that in many parts of Myanmar it is not possible to get yeah. a clean budget, a clean delivery kit and that uh, you don't even have a blade to cut the cord. But um, the most important thing, even if you use bamboo, uh, we would say if you can use fresh bamboo, everything has to be as clean as possible. If you haven't got a tie for the cord, then make sure you boil the piece of cotton that you are going to tie around the cord. So our number one message, if you don't have equipment, make sure you use the cleanest equipment that you can. Or if you use scissors, uh, that's okay to cut the cord, but it needs to be boiled. But we will tell you all these things uh, as we go along. Um, we, um, and we will show you uh, a video of, um, of, uh, a, 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 a sort of 10 steps to a clean birth today. Um, I just want to show you how, uh, this is how some of our uh, midwife, uh, this is a TBA, who uh, is listening to the baby heartbeat. Uh, and, and she had never learned that, uh, at, you know, from oh, the sorry. beginning of the week. We've lost your screen. Oh, here we go, perfect. Got it back on again, there we go, perfect. Uh, so here we go, Should... so just a clip of how we work. We do lots of practice. And if you can find, if you have, uh, if you can get a hold of a stethoscope, you can practice then you will be able to learn um, how, uh, you know, the more practice you do, if you find a pregnant woman, say, can I have a little practice? Uh, that would be good. And we'll show you what to do. Um, this is uh, finally, and then I'll show you a, a PowerPoint. Um, these are some trainers. Again, uh, what you can see in, in the bottom is a very small doll and pelvis. And they have just learnt, uh, they're learning how to practice a normal delivery just by oh, looking Sorry, we're, looking we're still at on the video. Head. We're still on the video. Are you able to move over oh. to the PowerPoint? Sorry to talk over you. Uh, Okay. Um, first of all, we're going to tell you the plan and then we will do a quick presentation on how a baby grows and also uh, show you a normal birth um, and what, what the 10 most important things are. So what we're going to do in the next few weeks uh, is, and um, Francis, please chip in when you need, uh, is uh, we will be recording some lessons like this, but we will be recording them a few days before Wednesday. I think we're all muted now. Um, we will be recording um, the lesson in advance before uh, Wednesday, and uh, Marcus will put them up on the website so that you can uh, have a look at it and take the time that you need, or if the bandwidth isn't good or whatever, you can watch the lesson. And then on a Wednesday morning, we will be here. We we will do a summary of the lesson and hopefully we can have some question and answer with you. Um, 
And please do use the chat if you can to ask questions. Francis and I want to be uh, want to be asked, want you to join in, want us to talk as much as we can using the um, internet. Uh, and we will be covering uh, normal birth. Um, we will cover some emergencies. So what to do if a woman is bleeding, or what to do if the baby comes bottom first, um, what to do, uh, what else, Francis? Um, you need to put your, uh, you need to unmute. Um, so bottom left. Um, so um, yes, we need um, to teach you about um, how to help a baby breathe um, and um, how to look after a baby it's just after it's born and to keep it warm. And also we'll stress about um, hand washing and keeping the area clean as much as possible, as Micah said before. We'll also talk about um, the postnatal period with the mother, how to observe her and make sure that she's not got an infection, and also for the baby, because babies also can pick up infections and they become very ill very quickly. And um, also uh, we'll look at breastfeeding. So there's lots and lots to do. Um, but we'd also also like to know your stories because these really help us to um, um, look at your needs. So please um, tell us about the stories of births you've been at or problems that you've had. So let's start with um, how the baby grows. Now we know that you've done a lot of training. We know that you know lots of physiology. So um, some of this may be repetition for you, uh, but in the UK, we often do training where it's the same information, it's repetition, and we just refresh our knowledge. But it's important to just have a look to see it, look at the physiology and to see how a baby grows, um, because that way you can um, see, uh, uh, you know, it helps you to understand how to advise the woman. So um, hopefully you can see my PowerPoint. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. We've yeah. Cool. Now I'm just, just trying to go into big screen. For some reason, I can't control my mouse. I'll do that in a minute. Um, so what we have here is um, the, uh, the pelvis. You can see uh, that before a woman is pregnant, um, the uterus is right down in the pelvis. Um, sorry, I'm just getting my... Uh, uh, Francis, if you, I've just lost my English version. Hang on, I'll be back. So these um, PowerPoints we designed um, when we took to um, Myanmar and very, somebody very kindly um, translated us them into uh, Burmese and we also have um, them in Chin. And now they've been put into a book um, so that when we train the TBAs and the TOTs, they each have a book containing all um, 18 of our PowerPoints and lectures. And they find this very useful for when they're out in uh, remote areas and they forget, for example, um, about how to stop a bleed or, um, you know, the, 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 the um, care of a, of a newborn or something, they can refer back to this um, um, book. So it's been a great step forward to have this and we're really happy. Unfortunately, of course, we can't... Um, let you have them at the moment, but maybe a time in the future will come and um, you could have some copies of these books. Okay, Micah? Yeah, I'm here. All right. I can't get it onto big screen, unfortunately, but don't worry. So uh, what we have here is um, the, uh, the uterus. You can see uh, on the right hand side 
you can see the two ovaries with all the with the eggs inside and you can see the tubes and how the egg will travel through the fallopian tubes into the uterus. Um, for some reason, I can't move off Yeah. Can you, yes, please. My mouse, for some reason, my mouse has completely stopped working. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, let me just... Don't worry, let's, let's see. Uh, okay, hang on. Oh, it's it, we're happy now. Um, I've got it now. I'm on it. Don't worry. Get me on the screen. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Just, just, do your, just do your Chris Whitty yep. next slide. Great. So, um, so you can see um, the maternal, uh, you can see her uh, reproductive organs there. Before pregnancy, everything is very down low. You can't feel the uterus. Uh, it's all very small. Uh, next slide, please. Mm. I think we have to exit. Right. Um, for some reason, uh, front, uh, Marcus, can we stop share? Uh, I need to reload this PowerPoint. It was all set up. Um, Francis, if yeah. if you can talk through a delivery of the pelvis, uh, a delivery of the baby, okay. uh, and I will just set up. Okay, everybody. Um, or if you can show the, um, yeah, just start with the cervix and the uterus while I just redo this. So the baby, this is the, the baby, the, the, the uterus, where the baby is inside. And within that uterus, the baby is also within, is in a bag of waters. Um, so I'm going to show you how the uterus works during a birth. Um, the, the baby's um, tucked in nicely, um, cervix is nicely closed before labour, and this is what contains the baby inside. And the bag of waters protect the baby through um, any bangs or um, problems during um, it, the time it's growing, and also leaves it to be able to freely move inside. So um, when the labour starts, there will be um, tightenings in the uterus. It's a big muscle. It'll tighten and it will shorten the fibres opening the cervix. So the tightening presses the baby down into the, into the pelvis and here's the pelvis. So the baby is tightly in there and here's the closed cervix. And as the contractions get stronger, the pains get stronger the uterus pushes the baby down against the cervix and it starts to open and it shortens and gets shorter and shorter and begins to open. And this for the first baby can take um, up to 12 hours, the first stage of labor. For a second baby, it can be much quicker because the mother has already done it. So she can be two hours, six hours, or maybe longer. But for a first baby, this early process does take quite a long time. So as the baby comes down, it opens more, as you can see, and this is still the first stage of labor. And as the baby comes down, eventually the cervix completely moves away and the baby's head comes through the cervix and down and into the pelvis. So this is the second stage of labor when the mother starts to feel like pushing and the baby will rotate and come out. So now I will show you how the baby um, <coughs> comes through the, through the pelvis. So most babies, and the best way for them to lie in the pelvis is on the back on the left side. And when we're, we're examining a woman in early labour, it's always important to palpate the, the mother so that we can feel which way the baby's coming. And you will feel the, the spine of the baby. The other good thing is if the baby tucks its chin on its chest, because you can see then that the diameter of the head to come through the pelvis um, is much smaller. If a baby doesn't 
um, tuck its head on, you can see that there's a much wider diameter. It puts its head back and this is more difficult for the, for the bird. So we encourage the mothers to be upright and moving during the first stage of labor to get the baby to tuck its chin on its chest. Um, as the uh, contractions get stronger, it comes down into the pelvis. And as we note, it comes in sideways. It can't come in like that. It gets stuck. So the baby's head is coming in sideways. And um, during the labor, this baby will come further down into the pelvis. And then as it hits the pelvic floor, again, it's so clever because it will rotate round. And in that way, it will fit better to come out. So at this stage, the mother will get a lot of pressure on her bottom and she will feel like pushing the baby out. So she will start to push. Oh, oh, oh. And good strong pushes, the baby's head will come down and through the pelvis. Oh. And once the baby's head is born, again, the shoulders have to come out. So nature is very clever. It will rotate around sideways. And with that, the shoulders rotate around sideways. And this makes it easier for the baby's shoulders to come through. So with more pushing, <clears throat> the shoulders then will come through that sideways diameter. And as you see, the baby then will come out and be born. And why the shoulders hang sideways is again, you can see that that is a narrower diameter. If the shoulders try to come out that way, again, it's much bigger diameter. So the baby's very clever the way it uh, rotates through the pelvis like that. So once the baby's born, <coughs> we lift the baby onto mummy's tummy and put the baby skin to skin. It's really important this so that the baby listens to mother's heartbeat, it keeps it warm, and you have that lovely effect. The other important thing is to dry the baby. So we dry the baby all over with one cloth, and then we cover it with a nice dry one. And then put a baby on, a hat on the baby. So the baby is born, um, it will be smelling mummy's milk, and maybe rooting for the milk. And this is important because this will help the placenta separate and be delivered. So this, for the delivery of the placenta, it's really important that we don't have a lot of pushing to get the baby with the placenta out on the top of the uterus. Um, because this can cause um, the, the um, the centre to not separate or to separate and leave a bit behind. So no pushing on the top of the uterus. And the other thing we recommend is that you don't try and pull the centre out with the cord. As you can see after the baby's born, you can see the cord and it's very tempting to feel that you get the centre out quickly by pulling it out. If you do any of these things, you can rip the placenta off the top of the uterus and cause massive bleeding. So we say the best thing to do is to wait and wait till the mother feels like pushing when the placenta separates and comes down into the bot her bottom. Or um, you can often see that the cord lengthens and then there is um, some bleeding when it separates and that's normal. It's good to see some bleeding because it means the placenta has separated. So once you feel the cord is, the placenta has separated, um, then you can get the mother upright and to push the placenta out. So no pulling placentas out because this has caused a lot of bleeding in the past. So this is a natural physiological of a placenta, which we encourage in remote areas where we have no oxytocins to help with that delivery. Um, and you need to be patient and wait for this to happen. So once that's happened, it's really important <clears throat> then to um, make sure the baby is okay. 
Um, tie the cord each side and then get a clean razor blade, as Micah said, or some scissors or a clean bit of um, bamboo. We have seen that used often to cut cord. And once the cord is cut, then you can take the, the placenta aside and check to see that everything is there. It's important to check the, ins the inside where all the bumpy bit is, that that's um, pr all present and to check the membranes to make sure that that's all there. Because if something has been left behind, then we need to, to watch the mother very carefully that she doesn't bleed. Um, and then also it's really important to get the baby breastfeeding or already breastfeeding because breastfeeding will help to stop any bleeding and be really good for baby to recover from the birth. Any questions about that? We got any questions or oh, anything I missed out, Michael? No, that was brilliant, Francis. Thank you. Is this position L O A or R O E? That was L O A. So the baby's back yeah. is on the left hand side of another. Left hand side, like that. So that's L O A. Put your camera down. That. That is LOA, this is ROA on the right hand side. This is ROP when it's tucked in and the back of the head is to the right here. And that's a more difficult birth because it takes longer. So the baby's head doesn't fit through so easily. And this is L LOA. Sorry, we can't okay. see you. We can't see you for some reason. Give me two seconds and we'll just sort that out. Right, try again, sorry. So um, this is um, LOA position. This is LOP when the baby is looking forward and the back of its head to its back to the mother and that's more difficult birth. So then the baby can also be on the right hand side. Uh, it's more difficult because the head is not in such a good position. When the baby's back, is to the mother's back, so R-O-P or L-O-P, uh, the head, you can see the head doesn't fit so well. And the, you will know this because the mother will get a lot of backache. She will get more back pain with her labor. And what we say when the baby's in that, that position is that to get the mother really moving, to get her swinging, to get her leaning forward, to try and swing the baby back and to get really good strong contractions because the contractions will push the baby into a better position. Sorry, Francis. Thank so, you. Okay. Um, I think if we, uh, if we, um, if anyone has questions and they can put them on the chat, uh, that would be great. And in the meantime, I will go back to the health in pregnancy. Um, and then we we have, um, we'll be showing you a clip, hopefully, uh, with, uh, again, where you see a normal birth. So exactly what Francis has done um, as well. And uh, hopefully that will reinforce the knowledge. But if you are thinking, yeah, Marcus. I oh, know, sorry, I was just going to ask, maybe um, Momo, you, are you able to ask if there are any questions in Burmese? And then if there, if there are, then, um, then we can kind of uh, yeah. go from there. Is that, does that sound okay? Just quickly, yeah. just ask if anyone. Yeah, sure. I already put it, I put something. Yeah, yeah, I, I saw. Yeah, there's someone, yeah, in Burmese. I've got a yeah. question, I've got a question up here already. When do we cut the umbilical cord after the placental delivery? That's from AA Moore. So as soon as the placenta uh, is, uh, we wait for the placenta to be delivered. And when it's delivered, there is no more blood going through the placenta, no more blood to the baby. The placenta, the, that's finished. So then you cut the cord. But it's important not to cut the cord until after the placenta has delivered. But there's no hurry. 
if you are busy uh breastfeeding the mother then um you, you know you you do that uh and then you you cut the cord when you have time there's no rush it's not going to hurt the baby great thank you very much for that question that was an excellent question to start us off um yes thank you Momo, I wonder if there are any other questions and people can ask in Burmese and it can be yeah. translated. That, that yeah. makes sense. Okay. <laughs> Okay, we've got another one. Um, sterilized. Oh, hang on. There's loads coming in now. Uh, so the next one. I really want to know about breast engorgement care. Is the next question that's come up great question um, um yeah. we will be doing breastfeeding is it possible to wait until we do that topic uh if you've got just just i mean there's there's loads that we can talk about it is there just anything just some quick it's you know, a, to, so the main thing is to if the breasts are engorged uh to use very hot uh if you can get a towel and uh you, the, it's important uh, not to overstimulate the breast because you will make more milk, but with a hot towel uh, to massage the breast when the baby is feeding uh, to, um, to make the milk move. And if there are any lumps, uh, any hard parts, you want to massage those parts to relieve the milk from the milk ducts. Uh, and the way, Francis, if you can just show um, how to if you if you change the position of the baby when the ba baby is feeding so it, you might feed uh, if you have a lump uh, if you show where the lump is and where you would position the baby's head and you would massage so I've got the baby under my arm it's mostly people feed this way okay but sometimes it's better when you're very engorged to put the baby under your arm. And if you have a lump here, you can fit the baby on and then massage the lump and put, helping to, to release the milk. And the milk engorgement, the engorgement is normal uh, in the first few days because the body is trying to calculate how much milk the baby needs. So the advice to the woman is uh, to feed the baby because that's the best relief, to use hot uh, towels, hot flannels, to massage and to put the baby uh, in diff different positions. And in a few days, the engorgement will settle. Um, but we will do more about breast care in, uh, in another session. Um, but they will soften in time because the, the, the body will calculate how much milk the baby needs. Uh, this, that was a great question. Um, thank you. Another question about sterilised instruments and CDKs. We do understand that you don't have access to clean equipment. But uh, if it's possible, if you are using a pair of scissors to cut the cord, and uh, you can, or a knife, uh, we, you know, that is okay if you have a sharp knife, but if uh, we need to boil the instrument uh, in a pan of water over the fire, that's not a problem for uh, 10 minutes and it will be clean. And if you are using your longie to, uh, even longie thread or thread in, in, uh, in the woman's house, Again, you can boil that uh, for 10 minutes with your scissors and you will know. Uh, and then if you wash your hands really carefully, even if you don't have gloves, uh, 
you uh, you can be as clean as you can. So we do understand that you, you you know it's not the same as in a hospital in Yangon or in a facility, a medical facility in uh, in the countryside. You just and do that, your best. And that's the other reason why we suggest that you put the baby skin to skin to mother straight after it's born and cover it up, that you don't put it on the floor or down on the bed. So it stays nice and clean and is warm and comfortable with mother. So this is really important that the baby's skin is up against the mother's skin. So you put it like, you take her top off and you put her straight to skin to skin. The baby not only will keep clean, but the bacteria, the good bacteria that is on the mother's skin will go on the baby and this will protect the baby from other bacteria, from bad bacteria. So skin to skin is absolutely essential and we will talk about that more. Uh, so we will go back now just quickly to... Uh, Uh, again, you, we cannot, thank you, great question, everybody, every baby is Maybe. born with a uh, we, we will look at episiotomy in the future, episiotomy, if, uh, for those people who don't, who, who are not that far in their training, is when you make a cut in the woman's uh, perineal tissue in the vagina to make the opening a bit bigger. Um, Episiotomy is almost never used in the UK. Uh, it, um, I have done maybe three or four in 18 years because when the baby is, when the mother is pushing the baby out, uh, you talk to the mother, you, uh, you, uh, it, it, we want it to be slow because we want the skin to stretch slowly around the baby's head. So, um, you, you, it is better not to do an episiotomy. And especially, we would not advise an episiotomy in the countryside because you can't keep it clean. You don't have uh, equipment probably to suture. To, so um, you, what we try and do is deliver that baby's head slowly uh, and to avoid a tear. Um, but we'll look at that uh, when we do uh, in another lesson. And also uh, in my uh, PowerPoint, we'll show you what twins look like. Uh, and we'll just briefly touch on that. Um, about uh, There's a question about giving birth to twins. But it's the same you do if they're, uh, you know, one after another. Preferably, uh, if it's possible to get twins to a, to a facility, uh, that would be better but if you can't you can't you do what you can right hopefully now we can uh, see the powerpoint again is that correct yeah great so uh and i'm going to do this really quickly because i know that the majority of you will know this physiology but you can see there that uh when fertilization happens the sperm travel up the uh, through the vagina, through the cervix, to the, uh, can you see my cursor moving? I think you probably yes. can, yeah? Yes. Uh, up the fallopian tube and they fertilize an egg. So this is fertilization. After fertilization, and I am going quickly because most of you know, the, uh, the fertilized egg will divide many, many, many times and it will travel down the fallopian tube so the numbers here are, are number of days, day two, after fertilization and so on. And on about day 10, the, uh, the uh, little ball of cells will uh, implant uh, uh, on the uterus wall. If this doesn't happen, if this happens up here, uh, on about in after two or three weeks, the woman will experience a great deal of pain. And if she has serious pain that could be that it is in the wrong place and again uh, that needs to hospital attention if it's possible but it's very rare normally the embryo will start here and you can see that the placenta uh, forms from that 
that it becomes that that ball of cells becomes the baby and the placenta um, and as the baby grows what you can see here is that uh, in the first 12 weeks so the top row is the first 12 weeks of baby's growth the first three months in the first three months everything everything uh, is put in place for the baby which is why uh, it's so important to tell women in the countryside to eat the best that they can. Uh, rice is great and just a few vegetables, um, those sorts of things. All the nutrition for the mother will make the baby grow properly and form properly. So the first 12 weeks are really, really important for the baby's development for all the structures to develop properly the next number of weeks so from the next uh 20 20 weeks everything is just growing maturing and so on until about 36 weeks when the baby if the baby comes at about 36 37 weeks so eight months uh the baby will be fine the baby will be uh, able to live outside the mother um, what you can see here is uh, what the embryo looks like uh, at about uh, about 12 weeks. Um, you can see the baby growing and the most important structure here is the placenta, uh, which you can see here. Everything that the mother eats and breathes uh, will go through the placenta. And the placenta is a very good filter. It will take away most any bad things that the mother has, but it's not perfect. So some substances, toxins, will go across the placenta, which is why the mother has to eat well and try and stay healthy. If she can brush her teeth, uh, it's really important because our mouths carry infection. So if she has a toothbrush and toothpaste uh, to keep your teeth clean that's really helpful sometimes uh, a mouth infection can lead to uh, a premature uh, delivery which you don't want you can see uh, in the bottom you can see how the blood vessels uh, from the mother go into the placenta and then uh, the exchange of blood feeds the baby through the umbilical cord and the waste from the baby goes back to the mother. So the placenta is absolutely vital. Um, so what do you, if you have a pregnant woman and she's saying, I'm pregnant, what should I do? You can see here uh, what to advise. Any fruit, any fruit is good uh, in chin, uh, when we first went, they, uh, the TBAs were worried about bananas uh, and, and saying don't, don't feed bananas to the woman. But any fruit, any vegetable, uh, if it's clean, um, is really good for the mother and rice. That's a great diet. Um, she doesn't need uh, anything extra except maybe uh, if she is anemic if she looks very white, if her eyes are very white uh, and you are able to get folic acid, um, then that's fantastic. But you may not have that. But if she if she looks very white and you can get folic acid or ferrous sulfate, um, a tablet a day will help her blood stay strong, will help the haemoglobin stay high. Um, the main things to avoid really are alcohol. I know Burmese women don't drink alcohol too much, but chewing and smoking are really, really bad. So uh, we need to tell our women not to chew and not to smoke. And apart from uh, a uh, folic acid or a specific pregnancy vitamin, uh, we must not be giving any uh, medication to the woman. Uh, she doesn't need it. Um, and sometimes it's dangerous. So uh, no, no medication is actually better than, you know, other kinds of medication, except for iron and folic acid. So you can see here the baby grows. As the baby gets bigger, 
you saw Francis holding the pelvis earlier, the uterus will come out of the pelvis and uh, the uh, abdomen will get bigger. And at the end of pregnancy, the, hopefully the baby's head will go down into the pelvis. We will talk about other situations when the bottom comes first. We will do that in another lesson. So here are your twins, the person who was asking the question. Uh, a twin delivery is more difficult. And uh, if it's possible to get a twin pregnancy to hospital, I don't know what the situation is, then that would be recommended. Usually the twins, you can see here, there are different kinds of twins, uh, monochorionic, dichorionic, uh, um, identical twins or uh, non-identical twins. But they're in, on the whole, so sometimes with one placenta and sometimes two placentas. But uh, very often they are both head down. So twin one would come first and then with more contractions, you need strong contractions. Uh, after twin one is born, twin two will come. Uh, it's possible that uh, twin uh, two will be bottom first. Um, that's, you can manage that uh, a breech, in the breech position. Um, so it is possible to deliver twins. The contractions, it's longer, so you have to be more uh, aware, more focused on bleeding, more focused on good strong contractions. Um, so, but again, we can talk about that more. But it, in a way, in, mainly it's the same, it's just a bit longer. Um, so that's the end uh, of the presentation. The, um, the, uh, the main thing is good nutrition, good nutrition, good hygiene. Uh, in the early months. Um, does anyone have any questions from that? Um, we have, uh, oh, we're nearly at nine o'clock. Uh, Marcus, would it be better uh, to just take questions now and then yeah. ask people to watch the 10 steps video or do we run over for five minutes? It's up to I'll you. I'll run over for five minutes, that's fine. Okay. Uh, so um, are there any quick questions from that? There's a question around, can I know update, um, can I know update danger from hour of birth uh, of prom uh, of baby? That's what they've written. Okay, so prom, it stands for prolonged rupture of membrane. So if uh, the, um, if the membranes have, broken uh, and the mother's water is coming out then uh, uh, then um, the uh, there's more danger of infection for the baby so the management of prom is uh, to uh, for the first 12 hours uh, to uh, observe the baby if you can take the baby's temperature, it should be around 36.6, 38, uh, 37, even up to 37.5. If the baby's, and if you can listen with a stethoscope, if you have no stethoscope, you can just put the fingers on the baby's chest and feel the heartbeat. Uh, the heartbeat should be between 100, 140. Uh, and if, if the baby looks fine, then there's no problem. Um, again, uh, if you have no equipment, then there's, or no medicine, there's not too much you can do, but you can observe the baby and just to try and uh, uh, feed the baby as much, uh, you know, just normal feeding, normal hygiene. Uh, thank you for that question. I can see um, somebody's talking about the Burmese font. I'm really sorry if that doesn't work. Next, if it, if it doesn't work for everyone, uh, we do have English font. Uh, we will upload this PowerPoint presentation in, uh, and um, so you can have it in English font if that's easier. Um, so if we can um, show the, uh, the clip, 
Uh, hang on, sorry. Uh, just try and get that up. Um, hang on, sorry. Uh, you will see the this film uh, at the beginning of our chat function. I put a link to this film so you can watch this again uh, yourselves. It's five minutes. Have we got five minutes, Marcus? Is that okay? Or do you want to stop? Okay. And okay. this shows you really, it really simple how to deliver uh, a, uh, a a baby in ten steps. There's no talking. So there's music, but if you cannot hear, it doesn't matter uh, because there's no talking, it's all visual. And it's not going to work, hang on. <sighs> Technology is not with us today, hang on. Can't see it now. I've got it here. Let me play it. Let me do it from here. Okay, thank you. You want to just turn yours off? Yeah. I'm trying. I think mine's off now. Is yours on? Great.
we can pause step by step. So number one, we know you don't have clean delivery kit, but if it's possible, make sure that you have something that you can wash your hands with, some clean materials. If you have some gloves, but you probably don't have gloves, but if you've got scissors, make sure they're boiled and bring them in, in a clean packet with you, clean bamboo, clean cord ties. Uh, so that is be ready, be prepared. Thank you. Number two. Uh, so then number two. Number two is just arrive and get yourself ready and get yourself organized. Number three. Um, she is, again, if you have a, a clean delivery kit, you make a clean space for the mother. If you have nothing, you get some clean longi and you just lay them out so that the mother has a clean area and the baby has a clean space for the baby to be born. The, um, the sterile blade is ready, uh, or if possible, some sterile scissors. Um, and uh, if you don't have that, a clean, fresh piece of bamboo, not bamboo from the wall of the house or from the floor, as clean as possible. Five. Uh, I know you know hand washing and we are all more conscious of hand washing since COVID, but it's absolutely essential uh, for the mother's protection to wash your hands. And if you have no gloves for your own protection to wash your hands, uh, every, you know, many times in a delivery, uh, when you touch the mother, if even if your hands don't look guilt dirty, we wash many, many times before we touch the baby, after we touch the baby, uh, before we examine the mother, after we examine the mother. We keep washing with soap, uh, the normal routine. Um, if you have gloves, then we re recommend you use them for the mother's protection and for your protection, but we understand that this may not be possible. <laughs> so here the mother, the nurse uh, is, the baby is delivered. We, as Francis showed, we rub the baby, we dry the baby, be. Uh, a wet baby gets cold very quickly, even in a hot country. So we dry the baby and also the rubbing and the drying stimulates the baby. The baby wakes up and takes a big breath. So uh, it's really important. And then you put the baby to the mother. Thank you, Mark. Here we see the cord cutting. Uh, this shows uh, umbil somebody with umbilical ties, but it doesn't matter. You make two ties, uh, one near the baby and uh, one uh, at the placenta. The, the one nearer the placenta stops too much bleeding, stops too much mess. And then with your clean scissors, you cut between the two. <laughs> The, uh, the woman has, as Frances showed, she has pushed the placenta out herself. She has not, the, the, 
the nurse, you do not pull the placenta, but here you see the nurse checking, midwife, that the placenta looks like it's whole, looks like everything has come out. It will look, uh, it will be smooth around the edges and the membrane will look uh, like it's complete. Uh, so it's always important to have a look. And finally, after the placenta, we feel the mother's tummy. Uh, you, you want to, the, the uterus will be contracted and from the outside, you can feel that it, it's nice and hard. Uh, and uh, if, if it's not hard and the mother is bleeding a bit, you can rub the mother's tummy, not too hard, but that will make the uterus contract and that will help to stop the bleeding. Uh, so, Francis, anything to add? I know we've run over, Marcus. Put your microphone on, Francis. Um, we can probably catch up with questions um, next time because there's probably lots more. Um, but I think um, uh, that was really good, Micah. I think we have finished. Yeah. Great. Thank you very, very much indeed. And this is the first, we hope, of a number of different uh, presentations on this topic. And thank you so much, Michael and Francis, for your for, um, uh, brilliant start. So thank you very much indeed. If it's okay, we're gonna move quite quickly over to Selena, yeah. Um, yeah. if that's okay. Thank you so much. And uh, we will be in touch during the week and sort out next steps from here, but thank you very much. <laughs> well, Michael, you're speaking and you're on mute. Any questions, uh, maybe could go to Momo, she could, yeah. uh, if there's anything, then obviously we can answer them separately. Right, yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I, that was helpful. See you next week. Yeah, thank you very, very much. Selena, are you there? You are there, you're on mute. Hello. Hello. Hi. Selena, introduce yourself and then share your screen and off we go. Okay. Oh. Sorry, I'm a bit rushed now. ไอ้อามีละจะมาเนมีเซลีนาบาจะมากาอังกฤษกะเลตุนะบิวเซียมาบาจะมาเอ้ยมอดีตายบะมาตะเนตลอกอะลุลุปูบาเดเปยาดา
if the child is still breathing, if they are very sick, we use a different pathway. So for a child who is not breathing or collapsed and needs life support, we use A, B, C, D, which is airway, breathing, circulation, drugs. If they are very sick, but not yet collapsed, then we use airway, breathing, circulation, convulsion and dehydration. Today, we're not going to be talking about a child who has some trauma injury. That's slightly different. Today, I'll be talking about sort of medical causes of, of arrest. Um, has anybody ever treated a child in hospital who has collapsed with bag valve mask? I'm sure some of you have. And the Not most important well. thing, there are lots of things that are important when we are thinking about this. Uh, being quick, being ready um, to respond quickly, having all the equipment is important. Responding as a team is all important. All of these things are about being prepared. Okay, so we think about who is on the team. Um, saving lives in our hospitals is a team effort and the nurses have a particularly important job. The doctors, they cannot do it alone. They also need the nurses too. And we need a system for handling an emergency that works and that everybody in the team is familiar with that. And that's what the hospital must think about and plan for themselves. So as a nurse, what you can do is you can know where is the emergency equipment in your hospital. Is it working and is it clean? Uh, if you know that a child is very sick and you think maybe this child is going to have a collapse or have an arrest, you can move them closer to the nurse's station so you can monitor them. You can check vital signs more frequently. Um, you don't need a doctor to tell you to do these things. These are things that you can do as the nurse and it's part of our important job in helping the doctors and being prepared. Sadly, even with the best CPR and the best um, response, a child is unlikely to survive a respiratory arrest unless they have intensive care and mechanical ventilation, which when I was working in Ayawadi, we didn't have these things in our hospitals. So even more important than being prepared for CPR is to prevent, prevent the child needing, uh, needing CPR. We can do that by recognizing when they are seriously ill and giving the patients appropriate treatment before they need CPR. So that might be things like um, antibiotic treatment for sepsis, oxygen for respiratory distress, all of these things. Um, we should never be surprised or shocked if a child in hospital needs has an arrest we should either do everything we can to prevent it and sometimes you cannot prevent it and in that case we should be prepared and have everything ready in the case that they arrest i think last week with marcus you talked about cpr with adults which focused on cardiac arrest and you talked about using the defibrillator Unlike adults, children collapse because of lack of oxygen to the vital organs, like a respiratory failure, or because of lack of blood flow to vital organs, such as severe anemia, dehydration, and septic shock. It's very rare that a child will have a heart attack, so they are less likely to need the defibrillator. The treatment when we are treating children with, uh, with arrest is different so, uh, so we use oxygen to give lung, sorry. <laughs> the main treatment that we give is oxygen and the bag valve mask ventilation. Uh, the delivery of oxygen through the bag valve mask helps um, with, the, sorry, I'm, I'm losing my train of thought. 
So that's the most the most important thing when we are treating children is different to when we are treating adults. When we are treating children, the most important thing is that we give oxygen through bag valve mask ventilation. So part of being prepared is that everybody on the team follows the same process and we follow a structured approach. So we have a flowchart that we follow and everybody should know the order that we do things. So we start with four S's, safety, stimulate, shout, and setting. So safety means checking that the scene is safe to approach. Um, it's important if you are out, not in the hospital, in another setting, that you do not put your own life in danger um, because then you cannot help anybody. So you must make sure the setting is safe to approach and to help that child first of all. And for safety, we also talk about hand washing. Uh, like we just said, that's to protect you and also to protect your patient. The next thing is once we've approached that child to stimulate the child, are they responding? Do they have any signs of life? So you can stimulate the child by saying their name. We can, we do rub on the sternum, shake their shoulders slightly, just very gentle stimulation. We don't want to hurt them, but just to try and make them wake up. If they wake, if they wake up, that's good. That's a sign that probably they are breathing. If they don't respond at all, then we need to get more help. So we would shout for help. Call the doctor, send somebody to get the doctor. If you're not in the hospital at that point, phone for an ambulance or ask somebody else to phone for an ambulance. And then the setting, we need to think about the correct setting to perform CPR. So we need a firm surface where you can perform CPR. You need your equipment, your bag valve mask, an oxygen supply. And you can either take that equipment to the child or if it's a, a small baby, maybe you take the child to the resuscitation bed or something like that. And then we use A, B, C approach. D is for drugs, which may be appropriate in some settings uh, if ITU facilities are available, but we don't, if we don't have the drugs, that's okay. We, the main focus should be A, B, C. So once we are sure that the child is collapsed and we are in an appropriate setting, uh, the next thing is we're going to check the airway. If there's anything obvious in the mouth, so we check inside the mouth, you can clear the mouth, but it's very important that you don't, you can only clear what you can see. You don't put your finger blindly into the mouth. The risk is that you can push any obstruction, you can push it further back into the airway and cause more problem. If you have suction, you can suction any secretions, any vomit that is there, you can just suction that, but again, only in the mouth. We don't go deep suctioning. And this position you can see, this is for an infant. So in an infant, we do a neutral position. So straight line like this. For a child, we do a slightly different position. We do a head tilt, chin lift position. So raising the jaw up like this for a child. The main risk with the airway you can see in this picture is that when the child is unconscious, they become floppy and their, um, their tongue can flop back and block their own airway. So in this case, we can do, there are different airway maneuvers we can do. One is the jaw thrust where you just hold the jaw slightly forward like this to open up the airway. And if you have oropharyngeal airways, you can also use those. Once we have positioned the airway so that it's open, we have checked the airway is clear, we can then move on to assess breathing. It's important to remember that if the airway is not clear, then we cannot do anything else. 
um, making sure the airway is clear is the most important thing and having a clear airway. So then once the airway is clear, we move on to assess breathing. One, uh, so we're going to look, listen and feel for breathing. So you're looking at the chest, make sure you're, when you're looking, you're looking towards the chest, not away. So you can see the chest is rising. Is there any um, chest movement that we're looking for? You can listen to hear for any sounds of breathing, any strider, any noises of breathing, and you can put your ear right by the baby's mouth to listen. And then you can also feel, can you feel any air on your face or can you feel with your hand, can you feel any chest movement? Generally, we do this for about 10 seconds. If the, air, if the baby um, begins to breathe well, the chest is obviously expanding, then we just give oxygen and we move on to C for circulation and checking for a pulse. If the child is not breathing, then we need to give bag valve mask ventilation. Um, it's important to remember that maybe the baby will have some gasping sounds like uh, uh, and this is not adequate breathing there must be enough breathing to give them enough oxygen so if even if they have some gasping we would still need to give bag valve mask ventilation i'm sure most of you have seen this before and you've given this so we would need oxygen in this case, turn oxygen up um, and making sure that you have the right position of the mask for the face. The bag must be big enough to inflate the child's lungs. If it's a very small bag, that won't work for a child. Um, you can use a larger bag for a smaller child, but you can't use a small bag on a larger child. You won't be able to get enough air into the lungs. It's also important to have the right mask fit. So these small round ones are good for little babies. And then this more teardrop shape, this is for an older child or for an adult, this shape we use. So the mask should be big enough to cover the mouth and the nose, but it shouldn't go over the eyes and it shouldn't cover over the chin. If there is a leak, that will stop you being able to get enough air into the lungs. So it needs to have a good fit over the mouth and the nose. And we use a CE grip. So you hold the mask like this, and then you use one finger or two fingers to hold the hard part of the jaw, to keep the jaw in a good position to keep your good airway position. So the first step, if the child is not breathing, is to give two effective breaths, not too fast. So we aim for one second inspiration, one second expiration. So one breath every two seconds. Oxygen flow rate should be about eight liters or more, more than eight liters, as much as possible. And the most important thing is to make sure that the chest rises. If the child is, if the chest is not rising, then it is not effective bag valve mask ventilation. So you can stop, you can reposition, you can check the airway again, check there's nothing blocking the airway, that your position is correct, try again. Sometimes different flow charts will tell you give five rescue breaths instead of two. We recommend that two is enough, but only if they are effective breaths. It's no good to give two breaths if the chest doesn't rise. After giving two effective breaths, then check for heart rate. So we check for heart, heart rate at a large pulse. So we might feel for a radial pulse or a brachial pulse or a femoral pulse. 
Plus, it depends on the age of the child. For a small baby, probably a brachial pulse is the easiest. For an older child, probably the radial pulse is easier. And we want to check that the heart rate is above 60 beats per minute, okay? If they do have a heart rate above 60, then that's adequate and we can go back to supporting the breathing for two minutes and then reassess the pulse again after one to two minutes and reassess the breathing and the pulse after one to two minutes. We think that about 20 effective breaths per minute is enough because there can also be harms from giving too much, too harsh ventilation. You can cause more damage sometimes if you go too hard. So about 20 effective breaths per minute is enough. If someone comes to help you while you are bagging, then they can help you with the circulation assessment and you can continue with the bag valve mask ventilation. If they don't have a good heart rate, if heart rate is very slow, less than 60, in that case, then you need help quite urgently. If the heart rate is less than 60, then we want to start chest compressions. This is different. In an adult, we do 30, breath, 30 chest compressions for two breaths. In a child, because as we said, it's more likely to be a respiratory problem, an oxygen problem, we give two breaths for every 15 compressions. And we aim for about six cycles of 15 to two, before we stop and reassess. So when we're doing chest compressions, we check we have the right position. So obviously the aim is to pump blood out of the heart. So you need to be above the heart. So we're aiming for the lower third of the sternum, avoiding the ziffy sternum in the middle of the chest, and we compress the chest to about one third of the depth. You can see here with an infant, they are using two finger technique because you don't need to press very hard to reach this one third of the depth of the chest. You can also use at the bottom there, your thumbs around the chest, which might be a little bit easier. I think that's easier. With a child, um, if they are a small child, just using one hand is enough. You don't need to use both hands. But same like when with adults, making sure that your elbow is locked and that your shoulders are above the chest to give good check. So it's very important um, to keep going with the effective breaths. So after you stop and give 15 compressions, stop two breaths, make sure you have good chest rise because that's how we're getting the oxygen into the body. If we don't have chest rise, there is no oxygen in the blood supply. So the CPR will not work. You're not getting oxygen around the body. So after two minutes or about six or seven rounds, we stop, reassess. Is there a pulse? If there is no pulse or slow pulse, we continue to give 15 compressions to two breaths. 15 compressions to two breaths. If there is a good pulse, but the child is still not breathing, then we continue with the ventilation. It's no good just because they have a pulse now that we can stop the ventilation. The ventilation is still the most important thing. Oh, sorry. Um, so once we've covered A, B, C, and the last thing to think about is D. If drugs are available, then we... Um... <laughs> sorry. 
that we're thinking about mostly is adrenaline. So we're going for one in 10,000 strength, 0.1 mils per kilo. We can slice up a large vein. So if only if you have enough help to do this and you have the drugs available, we would find a large vein or we can sometimes use the intraosseous route, which is where we put a needle straight into a large flat bone, um, normally the shin bone, if we are not able to get access. And we can repeat that after every three to five minutes. I don't think this is very often available in a lot of hospitals in Mia, and it's less important. The main things to be focused on are the airway, the breathing and the circulation. Without those, the drugs are not very useful. So hopefully after a few minutes, um, we will regain uh, a pulse and we will regain the child will start to breathing more. So at that point, we need to reassess very carefully. We need to, if they are unconscious, we can put them in the recovery position. So I think there's a video, there's, Marcus has lots of videos. And one of them is about how to put a child, uh, put a person in the recovery position. So we can take a look at that. And we also need to think about why they became collapsed and understand the underlying cause. Because the problem is that if we just treat the collapse and don't treat the cause, it will happen again. So um, I've found that, I'm sure you've all found in hospitals, is that after the arrest has finished, after the resuscitation has finished and the child is again, all the doctors and the nurses, they just leave. They think, oh, it's all finished now. But actually um, that child is still very sick. And however sick they were before they arrested, now they are even more sick, they're not better. So we need to find out what is the cause and we need to give correct treatment. And that will mean oxygen, it will probably mean glucose, give fluids, and to monitor them very, very closely. We go back to that thing about preventing the arrest from happening again. That's it, any questions? I'm very sorry, it's very difficult to teach this. It's a practical skill and I'm sure some of you have had practice of this before. So this is just a little, little bit of refresher. But do we have any questions? There are some yeah, questions. Yeah, Selena, I've put, put on chat. There are some questions in the chat, Selena. Oh, there is a question about, would I recommend mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation in a situation where there is no bag or mask or any oxygen facilities? Um, for a child, yes, I would. It's difficult in a COVID situation because like I said at the beginning, you have to um, put, don't put yourself at risk. So it's really down to whether or not you feel comfortable to do it. You know, I can't tell you like, oh, you must do this because if you think that it's not safe for you and, you know, if you get sick and then you go home to your family. Um, so it's up to you whether you take that risk. So in this case with an adult, if you are outside in the street, we recommend that you don't do mouth to mouth and you just do chest compressions. But with a child, I think if you are comfortable to give mouth to mouth, it is much more effective than the chest compressions. So yes, I would say that, but obviously it's down to your personal choice and how you feel comfortable with. If you are giving mouth to mouth resuscitation, I've personally never done it, but the important thing is that keeping the airway position, as we said, and then hold the child, you can hold their nose and just give them um, a breath into the mouth. Again, make sure that the chest is rising and with an infant, you might cover both the mouth and the nose with your mouth. And again, looking for the chest rising. How long do it? How long do we do it? I think that was the question. Was that if the question? you are outside of the hospital until help arrives, or until you are able uh, to get some help from a paramedic or from a doctor inside the hospital until the doctor generally will call uh will decide either they will start breathing again in which case you can stop or the doctor will decide that um 
the time is up. If you're outside the hospital, generally until, I don't know, it depends where you are, I guess. Maybe if you have to make that decision yourself, uh, there's not really a correct amount of time. But if you think it's been going on for several minutes and you're not getting anywhere and help is not arriving, then you can make that decision yourself. But in the hospital, either until they start breathing or the doctor will decide, no, it's too late, the, the child is, is dead. But it's not really the nurse will decide that ever. Do any of you have any experience? Have you ever given CPR to a child? Not at all. No, I haven't. Well, I wanted, um, Marcus has, yeah. I'm sure if some of you have already seen the website that Marcus has set up, there's no video on there at the moment about pediatric CPR, but there is some good videos about the, uh, how to put someone in the recovery position and about positioning the airway. Marcus, I thought we could show yep. those. You can see yep. where to find them. Yep. And they're in Burmese language. Uh, the, the MPS one isn't, but the other, the videos are, if we go back to the start, um, you can see here, uh, there are two things I want to show you. The first one, if we look at pediatrics and neonatal, and we head down the list all the way down here, so there's lots of things on there if you are not uh very experienced sure. on child ward or pediatric care there's lots of guidance this is the algorithm all very easy to use um this is quite um useful here this sentence at the bottom which was asking about when to stop i think if you're outside of a hospital and after 10 minutes you have tried everything and if the child is not hypothermic then you should probably stop and i know that's really sad but i think that's probably where we are yeah if the child is hypothermic there is good evidence that they can survive for longer. So for example, if you're dealing with a case of suspected drowning and the child has been under the water for a very long time, then um, it's absolutely fine to carry on for a little bit longer. Um, that's absolutely fine. But if after 10 minutes of effective CPR, you are not winning, you've not got an effective return of pulse, then it's probably okay to stop any time from, from there. I think just, as well, it yeah, depends yeah. how much help you have. Uh, yeah, most yeah, exactly. people don't realize how exhausting, very tiring it is to keep doing CPR. So you will not be able to keep giving effective CPR for a long time. So if you feel like you are not able to give effective CPR and you don't have any help, then that's as well, it, it's a good time to stop. So, and then if we click on the videos, which get better every time, we've got some really nice videos here well, which one are we looking at so this safe basic airway or safe rolling or basic airway and there was one about uh the recovery position because that's a useful thing to know because if you are outside okay, somewhere i think we did, the, we think we did basic yeah. airway last time let's quickly show okay. you the recovery position one safe rolling was that that one no there's a actually a recovery position one you're in it so you should know <laughs> Am I? Yeah. there we go so the recovery well it will explain in the video but the recovery position is a position if you find somebody in the street who is unconscious but yes. they are still breathing the recovery yeah, first one we're going to show you how to manage an airway and put a patient in a recovery position 
Hello, sir. Hello, can you hear me? Can you open your eyes? Okay, I'm going to listen to hear, see if there's any breathing or sounds of life. And I can hear that there's some noisy, obstructed sounding breathing. So to try to fix that, I'm going to do an airway manoeuvre. And in this case, I'm going to do a jaw thrust. So I'm going to lift the jaw up towards the sky. And as I do that, I'm going to reassess, listening to the breathing and feeling the breath against my cheek. And I can hear that the breathing is now smooth and the, the normal breathing sound. But I'm not going to be able to maintain this and provide a further assessment, or I might need to do something else like go and get help. Uh, so um, what I'm going to need to do is place Steve in a recovery position. And from what I've seen, I'm not concerned from this mechanism that there's a C-spine injury. Uh, so it's going to be safe for me to roll him onto his side. So briefly, I'm going to have to let go of his jaw and the noisy breathing will probably resume again briefly. And place his left arm up with his hand up in a high five sort of position like that. And we're going to come around here to his left side. Bring his right knee, I'm going to bend up his knee and stabilise it with my hand. I'm going to take his right hand and place that up against his left cheek. So the back of his hand is against his cheek. And then using his right knee as a lever, I'm going to roll him onto his left side, guiding him as he goes, pulling up his right leg and keeping his, the back of his right hand against his cheek. And with it, positioning him like that will allow anything in the airway to drain away, the tongue to slide forward and quickly he'll have a clear and open airway now, which he does and his breathing's unobstructed and sounds good. Okay, now you have to manage. So the recovery position is useful to know if you are not in the hospital, if you are out somewhere and somebody is unconscious, but they are still breathing. So you don't need to give uh, rescue breaths or anything. This position is good because it allows you to keep the airway open. And if they are sick or anything like that, it will drain and keep that airway clear. So that's useful to know. That's exactly right. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions from the group? Thank you so much, Salima. That was that was great. Thank you very much for your uh, for your presentation. Yeah. Any other questions from anybody else? Yeah. So um, someone has written. I think some people are having a problem with internet connection to join us. For some safety concern, for most of our students, it's more about data availability. Yeah, I think that's I think that's absolutely right. Um, I am working on that, so uh, I can't work on the security stuff. But in terms of data, uh, we are working on putting a plan together to support students who come to this session with their data. Um, but maybe we'll discuss more of that tomorrow in the seniors meeting. Okay, we have a video of this, so I will post the video to you, Momo, and then we can uh, we can get things moving from there. And, uh, and otherwise, I think um, if we're all okay, then we'll, we'll stop there, shall we? Yeah. Great. Okay, fantastic. Lina, thank you so much for your great presentation. <laughs> Not at all. And we'll see you again next week. Uh, we'll do hey. some more. Hello? Um, hello. Oh, hello. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, good morning, and. Um, very thank you for your uh, very thank you for your arrangements, and Selina also very thank you for your valuable lecture. No, thank you for coming. <laughs> we are very grateful you took the time to join us. Actually, uh, also I have a special request to you. Mm, uh, sure. <laughs> yeah, now we have a lot of uh, critical. We have a critical condition regarding COVID-19 situation. And we yeah. have a lot of patients recently. Yeah. As, as you know, the government cannot manage very well. Now yeah. we have to take ourselves and our environment. So I'm thinking now if you can give some lecture how to, how to manage COVID-19. Yep. Yeah. It, it, it is very valuable for us. 
if our nurses and nursing students know how, how to manage uh, and, and know and confident about the COVID-19 management, I, maybe they can help uh, their, their self, their families and their environments. Yeah. So it is a special request for, from me today. Thank you very much. Let's let's do that next week. Definitely. Let's awesome. let's drop let's drop Momo. We could drop the sessions next week and do a COVID week next week. What do you think? Great, yeah, fantastic. That's Great, yeah. What we need, yeah. Okay, I perfect. We'll do a COVID week next week. I will try and find uh, an intensive care nurse to talk about lessons from COVID, and we'll try and find someone to talk about home care for COVID as well. Thank you very much. No oh, problem Sorry, another question in the chat. Uh, I would like to ask about the differences between adult and pediatric CPR. Um, so the main differences, I think we said, is that with adults, generally it's a cardiac cause of the arrest. With a children, it tends to be a respiratory cause or a problem with oxygen or blood flow. <laughs> With adults, the most important thing is to give effective chest compressions. With children, much more important to give effective bag valve. Both are important in both cases, but especially with children, the bag valve mask ventilation is the most important thing. If you can only do one thing, you should do this one with the children, the bag valve mask ventilation, or the mouth to mouth if you are comfortable and you need to do that. So that's the main difference. With adults, we give 30 chest compressions to two rescue breaths. With children, we give 15 chest compressions to two rescue breaths. Any other differences, Marcus? Uh, no, I think, I think, uh, <laughs> I think you've, you've, you've nailed it. Okay, Any perfect. Other Any other questions? I'm conscious I don't want to use that people's data with silence. So mm -hmm. if we're if we're happy, then we'll see you all next week. <laughs>